I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this weekend um, to invite me. Um, I was slightly surprised when Isabel um, sent me an email inviting me because I, I have never published a structure using molecular replacement. Um, so we had an interesting conversation and, and actually I hope what I can bring to this meeting, which has been a lot about exciting new developments and new approaches, is things from a user's perspective. And, and I, I'm always, I mean, I'm really honored to be speaking at this, at this meeting. Um, I remember... It was actually 17 years ago that I was, sit I was one of the students sitting way at the back um, and on the last day, having partied hard the night before, it was tough. Um, so I remember that and it's, it's been quite a journey the last 17 years to come. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply honoured to be here and, and I hope I can bring some of, so, some of the stuff that we have le heard about this uh, last two days into the user's perspective and trying to put myself back in the shoes of that. Um, students 17 years ago and how to go about um, doing molecular replacement. So that's what I'm going to try and do, um, is what do you do if you have some data and you, you want to solve your structure using molecular replacement. So let's say you collected some data, and I'm now going to assume that all the things that Eleanor mentioned yesterday about quality, and, and actually not just Eleanor, but throughout, throughout the two days about the quality of the data being really important. So I'm going to assume you have good data. Um, you have your sequence. So the first step, if you want to do molecular replacement, at least from that naive user's point of view, and I now understand from a lot of the talks that we've heard in the last two days that this is quite a naive approach. There's, there's probably better ways out there to do things nowadays. Um, and some of the things that I'm going to talk about, I'm, we're going to redo um, after learning a lot this, this last two days. So uh, the first thing you need to do is, is probably search for homologs in the databases and see if there's any structures out there that are similar to yours. And you might actually already have some information, as Eleanor mentioned, because you, you know the biology of the, pro the, the, the protein you're working on. Um, in some cases, you don't like the, the, the venom um, um, uh, the, the serpent venom that we heard about. But in most cases, you'll know a bit, so you, you can do some uh, educated searches as well as automated ones in the databases. So you, you have some sequence alignments, and you retrieve some PDBs. You have your models. And as en Eleanor emphasized, and a lot of other talks have mentioned, uh, model preparation is a really important step. So the quality of the model that you use for molecular replacement is really key. Um, so you should, as Eleanor uh, Greta said, think about things at that point. You know, do, do some, some real hard thinking because that will make your life easier la later down the, the line. Uh, and that model preparation can mean you can, you can split your, your models into different domains and, and even you know, split it into smaller fragments. And we heard a lot about how this can be done uh, in an automated fashion. Um, and you should, as Andre mentioned yesterday, um, have mixed models. So you actually um, sculpt the, 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 the search model into the side chains so that they match the, the, the conserved residues in your um, target sequence. So after you've done your model preparation, you, do, you take that and you take your data, do some molecular replacement, and hopefully uh, sometimes you actually have to circle back to model preparation because your um, molecular replacement didn't work. That has, could be down to the quality of your model, so you can go back to that. Hopefully you can move on to model building and refinement and some cycles there, but that's you know, some, some more difficult cases. You actually have to go from model building back to... Um, redoing your molecular replacement or even redoing some model preparation. And, and obviously, we've heard a lot about how this can be done automatically. Uh, I'm going to kind of show you a few examples where we were doing it manually, so from a user's intervention um, perspective. And, and then, obviously, you know, hopefully, all you need to do then is complete your, and validate your model and deposit it. And there's loads of um, software out there that help you do all these different tasks. Uh, I'm going to mention some of them. Uh, others we tried and didn't work, so I'll mention them very briefly. But I'm, I'm, what I'm going to try and present to you is a practical case of how we've done it. And, and actually, Isabel's invitation has allowed us to revisit this data um, and, and look at it in, in a new light. Uh, and after yesterday and, and hearing about Ample and some of the fragment-based strategies out there, we're probably going to do it again, even after this meeting. So, very briefly, the practical example, you don't need to know a lot about my protein, but we work on the bacteria, it forms spores. If you're on antibiotics, you, you can, it can colonize your gut and cause inflammatory compli uh, complications. Sorry about the picture straight after lunch, but it's just to wake you up, um, just in case you're starting to doze off. 
Um, and, and this can cause death. It's actually uh, a, a severe problem because it's, it's a multiple antibiotic resistant bug. Um, so it's one of the super bugs. Anyway, type 4 pili have been associated with colonization stage of C. diff. That's why we're interested in it. And type 4 pili have been studied extensively in gram negative, and it's just in the last about five years that people have started looking at them in gram-positive bacteria. And there's a few structures out there uh, from type 4 pili proteins, mainly from, these, from the pillars. So the, 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 the proteins that make up the pillars are called pillins. Um, and they have been shown to be structural, to share some structural homology to the type 2 secretion uh, pseudopillin. Uh, and you can already, I'll, I'd like to point out that you can see this key feature, which is a very, very long helix. Sometimes um, with a few kinks and hinges, sometimes a very straight, long helix, so at least around 30 amino acids long, but some, in some cases it's even longer than that. And the stem of this alpha helix is meant to be involved in the aggregation of the different pillins to, to make the pili, to make the long filament. Um, so this is the kind of thing we're interested in, in solving. Um, this is the, the whole cluster, and we're just interested in the, the major pillin, so the pili one, for this purpose. So we had, we had a sequence, uh, and we actually replaced, because of the aggregation properties of that N-terminal end of the alpha helix, we truncated that and replaced that, the N-terminal residues with a, um, a histact for ease of purification. Um, we had a student, Karis, a summer student, who produced the first crystals, and then Adam Croshaw, um, who's now at VMXM with Gwyndaf, um, and did all the rest of the work that I'm going to be talking to you about today. So we collected really nice data set to 1.65 angstroms. Um, so at this point, we went, okay, let's try and phase this. And as I said, the first thing we did was we searched for homologs. And you can use either your sequence in the PDB or you can do blast searches. There's a, there's a whole range of different ways of doing it. This is just a kind of more straightforward, more streamlined way of, look, of going about it. Um, in, in our case, if you blast it, you don't actually find many um, interesting things. If you just use your sequence to search, either in blast or in the PDB, you don't, you don't get a lot of interesting stuff. So we ended up having to do keyword searches. So we used type 4 pili or type 4 pilin um, or pseudopilin to do searches, and we found a range of different proteins. Some of them have nothing to do with what we're looking for because there's different ways, there's different pilins and different ways of making pili. Um, but there's a lot of them that are related to what we're, that we know from the biology are related to what we're trying to understand. And you can see that clear feature of the long alpha helix, and this will become important later on. So, because this is a CCP4 we can, I'm going to focus the rest of you know, the practical side of the talk is how do you do it in CCP4 I2, which was also relatively new to me because I'm I've been doing this for a while, and I use this before I want a lot. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get your data, you need to get your sequence into I2, and in our case, what you would normally have, you would have started with a multiple sequence alignment, and from that you would recover your PDBs. We did it the other way around, so we had the PDBs because we did a keyword search. Um, so we took then those, the sequence from those PDBs and used costal W2 within I2 to get our multiple sequence alignment, and we had downloaded a bunch of PDBs, and we just first thing is we open them in Coot. Um, I think this is about 12 or 15 different PDBs. Um, and they're obviously all over the place and can't really tell anything from anything in there. So the first step in model preparation that we did was actually try and superimpose them um, to, 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 to start seeing common features. Um, and one of the models that we had was a related protein from C. diff. So um, that's what we used. We just... Um, superimposed everything onto that one. You can see, clearly see that all of the structures that we ended up at this point had this long helix. They all have a beta sheet sort of at the back, um, which is also characteristic of the structures of these pillins. And then they have lots of other stuff. So that which would be problematic when you're trying to do molecular replacement because that's, that's where the differences might come and that's what might make molecular replacement not work. So at this point, we went to sculpture. So for each of those PDBs, we use the sequence alignment and um, we ask Sculpture to trim it down to what's in common between the two, between our target sequence and the model that we were looking at. So that means we go from this to that, um, just based on, on sequence alignments between our target and the model that we're working on. 
And we did that for a range of different PDBs, and then we created uh, an ensemble, which we've heard talk about in the context of Phaser several times in the last couple of days. And we took that ensemble, um, so we also did that in, in I2, and we took that ensemble and tried to run Phaser. And what kept happening, um, so we went into molecular replacement with Phaser out of the different options that I showed you are available. Um, I should point out that we tried to do all this in the sort of more automated way, Ample and Mr. Bump, and all of those failed. Uh, and having heard some of the talks in the last two days, I think I have some ideas of why they could have failed. So we might go back to the automated versions as well. But anyway, we're doing it manually. So we went ran Phaser. Um, and uh, as Eleanor pointed out, one key thing, and I'll show you why in this case is particularly important, is you need to have an accurate estimate of your cell content. So you need to know how many molecules you're actually looking for in your asymmetric unit. So the Matthews coefficient is actually telling us that it's either, it's most likely four, but it could also be three molecules in the asymmetric unit. And I would like you to keep those numbers in mind, because it will, it will be obvious later why. So we did that and ran Phaser, and the first time we ran it, it came up with this error. So one of the models, it kept saying it's not, it's too, it deviates too much from the others in the ensemble. It's not very good. So I removed that one, ran it again, and then it started complaining. Model 5 and Model 8 aren't very good, so I removed it, and kept doing that to the point that I was ending up with one model in my ensemble, um, which was basically the same thing as running individual molecular replacement um, jobs, which is what I ended up doing. So I tried that. Individ ensemble wasn't working. Try individual ones. And I started by looking for three copies in the asymmetric unit and ran phaser, which took a while. Um, as Eleanor said, um, sometimes it can take a while, especially when it's not working very well. It actually started, it told me it wasn't, it, was, it, was, it wasn't confident it could do it right at the beginning. So this first line saying it will be very difficult came up within half an hour, an hour. Um, but obviously, I wanted to see what else it could do. So I kept I let it run, let it finish, uh, and actually the best solution it finds is in the wrong space group. Uh, and that's one of o an obvious thing. So when you're running Phaser and you don't understand the log file, as <laughs> Eleanor said, it, it actually does tell you a few things. So you can look at that, but there are other things that you should look at. And as Ellie mentioned, you should look at the scoring and you should look at the TFZ score and the log likelihood score. Um, and we've heard a lot about log likelihood. I'm not going to pretend that I understand it fully, but from the guidelines, if you have a TFZ score um, of six to seven, which is kind of where we are here, six, seven at the best solutions, it's unlikely you have a right solution. And the same for the log likelihood. If it's, if it's anything lower than 64 and it's in the round 20s, it's also unlikely that you have a right solution. So even without this, if you, if you looked at the scoring, you would understand that this is not the right solution. So the traditional looking for homologs, sculpting, um, running phaser wasn't working. And as I said, we have this extremely long alpha helix, which is a characteristic of these proteins. So, and we had a 1.65 angstrom data set. So at this point, and I'm not telling it chronologically, that's not how it happened. This is how it should have happened. What, at that point, what we should have done, because we had a long helix and because we had high re resolution, was go straight to watching Boulder. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't do that. We actually solved it initially with experimental phasing. This is kind of going back to the data. Um, and in Archimbold, this long pipeline becomes this. You just skip searching for homologs. You skip model preparation. You just need to have a good prediction of your secondary structure. Um, and in this case, we, ha we knew we had a long helix, so we were halfway there. Uh, and then you can just you know, you're do, do the other steps really easily. So that's what we did. We told Archimboldo there's three long helices in the asymmetric unit of about 30 residues. And it very quickly solved it. It, tra it traced about, well, there's 400 and something residues in the asymmetric unit. It traced easily 480 um, with a CC of 40, over 40%. So uh, a very clear and easy solution. And it would have saved us, and particularly Adam, uh, a lot of heartache trying to solve this structure if we had just gone straight to Archimboldo at the time. 
But you know, statistics are all very good. How do the maps look like? Well, this actually looks, um, as if you don't know, Archimboldo builds a polyalanine model. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, the map that comes out af uh, after Archimboldo's finished the run. And you can clearly see the very nice s side chains. You, you know, you can, anyone can, can see that that's a tyrosine. So that was fantastic. Um, just to double check, we put it through Buccaneer and RefMac really straightforward to run as well, and it built 100% of our model um, with an R factor of 27%, which, uh, and even, you know, the log of Buccaneer is telling us that the model is approaching completion. So it was a really, really straightforward case once we'd done the right thing. And yeah, just to show you the maps, they're actually quite good. There are some regions that probably you need to go and check. There's some loops and, and some confirmations, double confirmations, because we are at high enough resolution that those are important, that you should probably do some visual inspection um, and manual model, model building. I just want to focus on, on a final little approach, which um, I mentioned briefly in my first slide. You, another way of searching for homologs is using FIRE2, which takes secondary structure prediction against the database and creates a sort of a, a best fit model kind of thing. Um, so we did that just, just to check. And in this case, because we had a high confidence, we didn't have to worry too much about model preparation. We could go straight into molecular replacement with phaser. And we searched again for three copies. And it found a solution. So now you can see uh, the clear difference from the um, output that um, CC4I2 is, is telling you. It, it even tells you it found a unique solution. But if you miss that, because it's in small letters, if you look at the stats, it actually has a, Z, uh, a TFZ of over 30 uh, and a log likelihood of over 1,000. So it was, it's very clearly solved it. How do the maps look like? They look quite good. Good separation between protein and solvent. All the side chains, all the three different molecules are well defined. Um, and just as a word of caution, I don't know if you noticed, but I said at the beginning, when we calculated how many molecules there were in the asymmetric unit, the highest probability in the Matthews coefficient was for four molecules. And I've just shown you two solutions where we only looked for three. And, and actually, when we use exactly the same model to look for four, which is in theory the correct solution from the, from the Matthews coefficient, it actually is the wrong solution. And it tells you it's overfilled. So it's basically, it's just, what it's telling you is that it has a higher con solvent content than the average. Um, and that's, that's just a warning that looking at Matthews coefficient and, and unit cell contents and going what with the highest might not always be the right solution. So when you have cases like that, which are a bit, it's like 60% and 30% of uh, the two possibilities, you know, it's close enough that you should try the two options and see what happens. So this is more like a word of caution that you, know, you need to be careful. As Eleanor said, knowing how many molecules you have in the asymmetric unit is a really important um, aspect of running molecular replacement. Um, so yeah, then <coughs> we did the same thing, put it through Buccaneer, the right solution from fire, and it actually builds slightly less um, residues than the solution from Archimboldo. Um, but yeah, it's still a correct solution. The maps still look nice. Some regions are actually worse in the, than in the Archimboldo maps. So I hope I've given you a view of how you, when you go back to your labs and you're trying to... to use all the wonderful tools we've heard about in, in um, the last few days from the developers pushing the boundaries. How can you go about solving your problem, your structure um, in your lab, and the kind of things that you should pay attention to, um, and the kind of caveats that come with running some of these more automated pipelines. And I'd just like to thank um, people in my group, particularly Adam, um, who did all of this work. And um, this was a project in collaboration with Neil and Ed at Imperial. And thank you all for listening.